Each autumn in Monaco, the flags are out all over the town. Red and white, the colors of the principality since 1857. On the summit of the rock, the Prince's Palace. A thousand spectators have come to witness the most symbolic event of the year. The 19th of November, Monaco's National Day. It's not independence that's celebrated, but the prince himself, Albert II of Monaco, who, as tradition demands, will appear behind this window in just a few moments. For the first time, Prince Albert has agreed to be filmed at this, a moment that is both intimate and solemn. Exclusive video of the Grimaldi, nearly all of them present, accomplices huddled together behind the palace walls. The prince's sisters, the younger, Princess Stephanie, and the older, Caroline, the Princess of Hanover, and her two sons, Andrea, who is 28, and Pierre, 25, and the new generation's most glamorous representative, their sister, Charlotte Casiraghi, aged 26. Around them are their close advisors and counselors, and of course, the wife of the sovereign, Princess Charlene. At 11.30, Albert II signals to open the window. the traditional meeting between a princely family and its subjects. It's a real test of popularity. C'est vraiment le jour où il y a cette comment je peux dire cette cohésion et cette communion visible. C'est de plus en plus fort parce que parce qu'autour de nous c'est de plus en plus compliqué. On a conscience d'habiter un pays privilégié et donc euh, on a envie que ça continue. The enthusiasm seems unanimous. So what is the secret behind the ties that connect each of the Grimaldi to the Monegasques? Beyond its very mediatized couple, and a family that often features in the gossip magazines, this will be the real face of Albert II. For a year, the prince allowed the cameras into the palace and behind the scenes as he rules the second smallest state in the world after the Vatican. From a sometimes remarkable diplomacy to his personal interests, how does this well-known sovereign work for the benefit of Monaco? At the heart of power, a unique insight into the most prestigious and influential principality in the world. Monaco is a small enclave on the Riviera with 38,000 residents, including some of the richest people in the world. There are 10 times as many bank accounts here as residents. Well before the casino, it was finance and property that made the small nation's fortune. Monaco is a prestige brand managed from the wings by Prince Albert, from behind the palace walls. And from on top of this high 13th century Genoese tower. There in his private office, he takes the decisions that matter for his tiny state, and with a certain amount of humor. Ah, voilà un beau parafeur avec des, avec des remerciements. Ça, j'aime bien faire. Ça, j'aime moins faire. <laughs> Qu'est-ce que c'est? Ça, c'est ce qu'on appelle des ordonnances souveraines. C'est, voilà, pour nommer différentes personnes, différents postes. Allez. Today, a new director of tourism needs to be appointed. In his office, the prince supervises everything. A very personal universe rarely opened up to the cameras. 30 years after her death, the memory of his mother, Hollywood star turned princess Grace Kelly, remains as strong as ever. C'est l'ancien bureau de ma mère qui a été sûr, remodelé depuis, de, depuis son époque. Il y a plusieurs tableaux que j'avais choisi avec ma mère. 
Et euh, c'est vrai qu'il y a beaucoup d'objets, beaucoup de documents, beaucoup de dossiers, beaucoup de papiers et beaucoup de livres. Disons que j'ai l'habitude de ce désordre ordonné et euh, j'arrive à m'y retrouver. Ne vous inquiétez pas, il n'y a aucun retard, non. aucun dossier sensible. <rire> From an office filled with art and private and public photographs, the prince has ruled over Monaco for seven years. An office seemingly sheltered from the frenetic pace of the outside world. And no sign of any computers or the internet. I have a complicated relationship with the internet. We see very few times per year. No computer, but a lot of medals. Valued souvenirs, particularly the trophies from his days as a champion bobsledder. There are some medals of course, medals of gold that I had won in bobsled, a bit international. And voilà, c'est celle-là, Coupe de l'Amérique, pas celle de voile, mais celle de bob, en février 2000. Donc voilà, ça reste un très beau souvenir. Souvenirs of a time when he was still just the heir and could indulge his passions. A relatively carefree existence that ended on the 6th of April 2005 with the death of his father. After his 56-year rule, the death of Rainier III at age 82 shocks Monaco. A half century during which the Builder Prince, as he was known, changed the small state into an opulent principality. It's an ordeal for his son who needs to overcome the immense void. Three months later, on the 12th of July 2005, Albert II officially succeeds his father. It's the moment of truth in front of his people. Nous ne pouvons réussir quand nous rassemblons tous. Car, comme l'a dit un grand poète, toute puissance est faible à moins d'être unie. Vive la famille monégasque, vive la famille monégasque et vive à Monégasque. Aged 48, His Serene Highness Prince Albert II becomes the 14th sovereign of Monaco and the youngest monarch in Europe. An accession to the cheers of thousands of Monegasques who had watched him grow up. It's not so much the solemn character of the event that, uh, that struck me. It's the, uh, the generosity, the warmth, and the uh, outpouring of emotions that I felt that day from, from the Monegasques. I felt their, their, their support and their, uh, and their encouragements uh, very, very deeply, and, uh, and that, that moved me very much. Once in power, Albert spends many long days working, interspersed with numerous meetings held mostly inside the palace. The palace is the heart of the Principality. It's been the residence of the Princes of Monaco for 700 years, with its sumptuous rooms such as the Salon des Gardes. The York Chamber is now a museum, with its 17th century painted ceiling, an allegory of the Four Seasons. And the majestic throne room, with its baldachin, or canopy of red velvet embroidered in gold, and the Latin motto of the Grimaldi, Deo Juvante, with the help of God. And the ice room, in white and gold, where the prince will shortly meet the new British ambassador. And here, the high dignitaries are received in the manner of heads of state. France and Italy are the only two countries with an embassy in Monaco. Most of the other 142 nationalities are represented in the Principality, 
by the ambassadors in Paris. Oh. Sir Peter Ricketts, the new British ambassador to France and therefore also to Monaco, is welcomed with full honours in the palace courtyard. Recently nominated, he's come, as custom dictates, to present his letters of credentials and to present himself in person to Prince Albert. Son Excellence Sir Peter Ricketts, ambassadeur de Grande-Bretagne. Monseigneur, j'ai l'honneur de présenter à votre Altesse mes lettres de créance et celles du rappel de mon prédécesseur. The prince shows the same regard to all the ambassadors of those countries that have huge economic interests in the principality. But what exactly is in the letter of credentials presented to the prince? The secretive palace archives are where that question can be answered. They have never been filmed before. The memory of the Grimaldi dynasty preserved along four kilometers of shelves. Thomas Fouilleron is a historian and the guardian of this treasure trove. He's responsible for archiving the famous letter. L'enveloppe est scellée avec le sceau de la reine Elisabeth. Elle est signée de la main de la reine Elisabeth, Elisabeth Regina, qui appelle le prince Albert II, son frère et cousin, selon la terminologie habituelle, des monarques qui se considèrent comme tous cousins. One letter that joins the thousands of other surprising documents. Among them, a precious file kept by request of Princess Grace herself. A few drawings by Prince Albert when he was a schoolboy. En 3e B, il s'essayait au bois gravé. Le cowboy et les Indiens, sans doute une allusion familiale aux États-Unis. Among the archives, a card for Mother's Day from when the prince was still a very small boy. Chère maman, je voudrais tellement vous dire tout ce que j'ai là dans mon cœur, mais je ne puis que vous sourire en vous offrant ces quelques fleurs. Mes deux petits bras vous enlacent, c'est bien mieux que de longs discours, c'est tout mon cœur qui vous embrasse pour vous redire mon amour. Bonne fête, maman. Tender words that reflect the close relationship between Prince Albert and his mother. These images were taken just a few days after his birth, on the 14th of March, 1958. Albert, bring that little uh, football over here. As the years go by, Princess Grace will instill in him a passion for sport. You can throw it, but come with it. You can throw it. Ready? Go. Competition is a family affair as far as the princess is concerned. His father was a triple Olympic sailing gold medalist. Sport and its values are, in her opinion, indispensable qualities to rule over Monaco one day. Ready, go. The prince and heir will be strongly influenced by his education. At 16, he seems more passionate about sports and winning than the throne of his ancestors. This report was filmed in 1974 and shows him undertaking several disciplines. Prince Albert spends his high school years in Monaco, surrounded by his friends, like any teenager. It's what his parents wanted. La timide. Euh, moins maintenant que je l'étais avant, mais toujours un petit peu. Vous avez, vous avez exactement la même éducation que tous les autres enfants de Monaco. Euh, je le crois, oui. Je le crois. Euh, je pense que c'est une bonne chose. Enfin. Sport remains a passion for the prince, and it's what led to his meeting with his wife. It was the year 2000 at an international swimming competition in Monaco. From the stands, Albert sees 22-year-old Charlene Whitstock and asks to meet her. Charlene and I met at the uh, banquet that followed the international swim meet in, in Monaco. Uh, and uh, so, of course, I 
met her that evening uh, for, for the dinner, and then I invited her to have a, a drink after dinner. It was a, it was a great moment. The prince has been courted by some of the most beautiful and richest women in the world who dream of becoming princess. Charlene, without airs and graces, but with humor and simplicity, charms the prince that night. Yet the next morning, the young swimming champion heads back to South Africa, and the couple lose touch for five years. Then Charlene calls the prince after the death of his father. A few months later, in 2006, a photo of the couple at the Turin Winter Olympics makes the front pages. And five years later, Charlene Whitstock says yes to her prince in front of a TV audience of 100 million. Charlene Linette, voulez-vous prendre Albert Alexandre comme époux? Oui. Aged 33, the young South African becomes not just the Princess of Monaco, but also a Duchess four times over, a Marchioness also four times over, a Countess seven times, and a Baroness nine times. In marrying this man, she also marries the job. As the First Lady of the Principality, Princess Charlene represents Monaco on official visits around the world with her husband or on her own. She's one of the most photographed women on the planet. A radical change in lifestyle and the sudden fame that the rather private princess puts to the service of others. She is about to preside at a charity gala for the first time, and every gesture will be carefully observed. The gala evening attracts the beau monde to Monaco. Here's the model Ines Sastre, and the footballer Christian Carambeau. Camilla and Charles de Bourbon of the Two Sicilies, and the Infanta Maria Pilar de Bourbon, the sister of the King of Spain. All are here specially for the inaugural dinner of a new charity set up to fight autism among children. But the person everyone is waiting for finally arrives. Princess Charlene, who usually shies away from journalists, has even agreed to be interviewed. But her French is still hesitant, so she talks in her native English. It's a pleasure for me to work with children and um obviously to support children and families that are have challenges in different areas. I'm really happy to do that. She plays the MC to raise money. Not easy and something modern princesses have to endure. Being a princess is not a fairy tale, but a real job. How did you teach her to do that? Well, I didn't have to teach her much. She, she, she knows how to... Uh, do that very well now. And, uh... <laughs> it's not easy, it's we know that. No, it's, um, you know, if it's, um, it's, if it's for benefit, mm -hmm. obviously it's going to benefit a lot of people, you know, and I'm available to do that and will always be available to do that. It's precious to be together tonight. It's always precious to be together. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Supported by her husband, Princess Charlene has settled into her role. Her first charity soiree brings in 180,000 euros for children with autism. Generosity is a Monegasque speciality. The Principality is one of the world's most important fundraisers. A distinguishing mark in no small part due to the personal involvement of all the Grimaldi. At the port, Princess Stephanie accompanies the sovereign under the media glare. <laughs> Age 47, the most rebellious of the Grimaldi clan never cared much for the rigors of protocol. However, she is actively involved in the fight against AIDS and can always be found at her brother's side for this particular cause. <laughs> Both are long-time experts at giving autographs. 
Voilà. Merci, merci beaucoup. Vous pouvez le garder. The two royals sponsor the No Finish Line, a foot race held annually for charity, which attracts more than 8,000 entrants. And for the past 13 years, the prince has officially started the race. It's an original and popular event. For an entire week, anyone can join in and run or walk day or night along the port. Every participant pays 12 euros to enter, and the more kilometers they cover, the more money the organization donates to a charity for underprivileged children. To raise even more, the prince himself will don his running shoes and join in when he finally has a few hours free. It's long past midnight, and as the principality sleeps, and the port is almost deserted, a car pulls up at the docks. It's the prince arriving almost incognito. Hop là, bonsoir mesdames, bonsoir mademoiselle, bonsoir monsieur Bruce. Bonsoir monseigneur, on est respect. Mais vous êtes trop couvert, qu'est-ce que c'est que cette soirée J'ai mis les couleurs de. Ça va bien. Ça va bien. Bonsoir monseigneur. Comment tu vas Ça va. Albert II, in his sports kit, has come to join up with the organizers, who are putting in a few hours overtime this evening. Bon, allez, on fait nos centaines ouais, de tours, va. là. Allez. Une centaine Moins 120. 122, ça, ça, ça veut dire euh, ou, un ou deux. Hein. Pas... Mais... Objectif, combien de tours, messieurs Après 10, on verra. <laughs> non, deux ou trois. <laughs> Merci. Parce que je sors de table, en plus. Hein. <laughs> The prince has just emerged from a substantial official dinner, but will undertake a few laps of Monaco's marina. 1.3 kilometers with a small following and always with a smile. C'est là où j'accélère pour perdre le cameraman. A friendly nighttime jog, but with his bodyguards in attendance. Oui, il faut. Un peu déguisé. Voilà. On dira rien. Hein? 45 minutes later, at 1.30 in the morning, the prince crosses the finish line. An anonymous runner who tagged along comes to say hello to the sovereign. Among his 24 aristocratic titles, Albert II of Monaco is the sire of Matignon, a small village in Brittany. It's a hereditary title dating back to the 18th century, but there is no ceremony this evening. The prince often surprises people with his openness. The charity's funds have been boosted by the prince's participation. 275,000 euros has been raised for the various associations. Merci. Day and night, the prince's life is a real marathon. Merci. His agenda is full of events of every kind, 400 a year, and that's just in Monaco. Nine the next morning at the palace. A typical day for Prince Albert. A succession of meetings until the evening. Whether it's a trip to a building site for a new yacht club, a gigantic building 200 meters long in part built over the sea to attract the wealthiest yacht owners. Or the daily cabinet meetings with his five councillors. Voilà les 140 000 euros, vous aviez déjà validé, Monseigneur Yes. With whom he manages the day-to-day -day business of the economy, social affairs and internal and external policies of state. Pasteur, et d'autre part sur le budget de la coopération.
and weeks punctuated with official occasions such as the inauguration of the National Council. Marcus Miller, Paul Savoie. Oui, oui, oui. And the prince has regular meetings with his government, led by his Minister of State, Michel Roger, a Frenchman who is presenting the budget for 2013. The Monegasque budget is unique. It's the only country in the Eurozone not to be in debt. The prince's diary is fully booked for 10 months in advance. But there is one thing he always finds time for. Albert II may be the head of one of the smallest and most densely populated states in the world, a concrete jungle dotted with buildings. But many of his policies are based on his firm belief in the environment and protecting the planet. The cameras follow him as he attends a United Nations summit, some 9,000 kilometers from the Principality. It's late June in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. It's sunrise on Copacabana Beach. Security is tight. The city is playing host for three days to the Earth Summit. 191 countries and 79 heads of state are gathered for the UN Conference on Sustainable Development. In all, 44,000 participants. Including tiny delegations such as the Peruvians from the Andean Cordillera, as well as the huge, as from Russia, its participants following behind Dmitry Medvedev. All have their opinions on the over-exploitation of the oceans, global warming or new renewable green energy. Look at sustainable oceans. Among all the leaders, Prince Albert is determined to make his voice heard. It's an important day that starts early in the morning on the top floor of this luxury hotel. Up early, the prince surprises his aide-de-camp. <laughs> it will be a very long day. But first stop is to the fitness center. It's become a habit of the prince whenever he travels abroad. To start the day, Albert invites his team for a dose of morning exercise. It's 30 minutes of cardio and weights. Lieutenant Colonel Lebeg has been aide-de-camp to the prince for four years. A veteran of the French army, he is responsible for enacting his orders and making sure he's comfortable. The prince chose him as he is an experienced polyglot who is familiar with the ways of many countries, a skill that is about to be put to good use. Just time to put on a tie and a jacket, and an important visitor comes knocking. The aide-de-camp greets him on behalf of Prince Albert. Actually, my name is Pikitsa. Thank you, Mr. Kansa. So, I'm the ambassador. Mr. Sucret is the Thai consul and is delivering a gift from the princess of Thailand for the prince. So, anyhow, sir, the princess. May I? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Would you like to, to follow me, Your Excellency, please? Since coming to Rio, the aide-de-camp has had a series of meetings. In his room are several diplomatic considerations. Ici, par exemple, vous avez vous avez un set de table qui a été offert par la présidente Dilma Rousseff. It's a gift from the president of Brazil. Je ne vais pas tout dévoiler, mais enfin tout déballer, mais enfin vous voyez, ce sont des sets de table. Vous avez également le président du Kiribati qui a offert ce magnifique terreré. Par exemple, qui est une arme traditionnelle de Kiribati, faite en don de requin. Voilà. Kiribati, a minuscule archipelago in the middle of the Pacific. 
one of the small nations that are expecting much from Monaco. In the afternoon, the prince will present his proposals on sustainable development. The aide-de-camp brings him the finishing touches to his speech. The prince will need to fine-tune his speech to make it stand out from the other 190 presentations. En premier lieu, celui de la place d'un nouveau modèle économique, mm -hmm. qui vous suggère de remplacer par économie verte, qui mm -hmm. colle davantage, si vous voulez, à l'esprit de la réunion. Ah, ouais. okay. To defend the values he holds dear, Prince Albert, once so reserved, today has no hesitation in forcing his point of view. Ça a toujours été un exercice un peu difficile, c'est jamais facile de prendre la parole en public. Euh, je m'y suis habitué, les débuts étaient un petit peu plus difficiles, mais. Non, je n'ai pas, pas le trac particulièrement, j'ai le, le souci de, de, de bien faire les choses. Euh, Et est-ce que vous en faites un certain nombre par an oh, Plus d'une, largement plus d'une centaine. Oui. How does the prince use the good name of Monaco to further the cause of world environment With security ultra tight, the motorcade of official vehicles heads out of downtown Rio for the immense convention center where the prince is due to address the conference. A speech in front of 3,000 people. Monsieur le Président, si le succès du Sommet de la Terre de 1992 fut indéniable, le bilan est toutefois contrasté 20 ans plus tard. But Albert is fully aware that though there are some great speeches, to really make the change when it comes to the environment, it's mainly a matter of tough negotiations behind the scene. Once his speech is finished, he begins his round of meetings. He heads towards the large passageways and corridors where each country has its own stand. It's the start of an extraordinary round of diplomatic ballet. Je pense que ça s'est bien passé. C'est toujours difficile de parler dans une salle où il y a beaucoup de mouvements et beaucoup de, de, de bruit de fond. Mais euh, il y a une personne qui est venue me féliciter au moins, donc c'est déjà ça. L'ambassadrice de Slovénie. Right after the interview, there's an opportunity for an audience. Merci. The delegation is from Benin. Je vous en prie. It will then be one meeting after another for Albert. President Kibaki of Kenya is keen to meet with the prince too. While the principality may be physically the smallest nation present, it punches far above its weight in terms of influence. <laughs> The meeting will see President Kibaki receive generous financing from the prince. The aim is to further the cultivation of a promising plant in Kenya, Chitrofa, which is capable of producing biofuel. It's clean and cheap and a potential fuel of the future, in the opinion of the prince. Ça peut être un moyen de, eh bien, de faire marcher des groupes électrogènes, des petites machineries, bien sûr, ne polluent pas. Si on ne règle pas, si on n'essaie pas de trouver des solutions à problèmes liés à l'environnement, problèmes de, de, de déforestation des océans, mais surtout du climat, euh, nous aurons de, de, de très très graves problèmes à plus ou moins longue échéance. Which is why the prince has already financed some 200 similar projects in 80 different countries, from forest preservation in Indonesia, protecting reefs of Madagascar to solar energy in Laos. The desire to defend the planet has seen the prince invest 3 million euros a year through his foundation. Avec plaisir, okay. merci beaucoup. Au revoir. Au revoir. The summit ends and the prince heads back to Monaco for a cause which made the principality famous well before the fight to save the environment. 
It's midsummer, and the 64th Monaco Red Cross Gala Ball is due to be held the following evening. It's the most important charitable soiree in Europe, and the most glamorous. In a few hours, the Principality's Red Cross will raise half the funds it needs to look after the disadvantaged. A summer night at the Sporting Club, which is being discreetly prepared. Hello. Hello. Um, uh... Um, I'm Jean, I'm the promoter. Oh, nice to see you. Nice to you. Nice. Jean-René Palacio is the artistic director. No, 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 it's nice. The ballroom will be completely transformed in just a few hours. 800 guests are expected and everything still needs to be done. First held in 1948, it was Princess Grace who, in the 1960s, made the gala into a social event not to be missed. On behalf of the Red Cross, she delved into her address book and invited all her Hollywood friends, Ella Fitzgerald, Frank Sinatra and Roger Moore. Josephine Baker and Shirley Bassey are among the stars that have appeared on stage. The Red Cross Gala becomes a magnet for the jet set which can mingle with the princely family. It's also the evening that Princess Grace chooses for her son Albert to make his entry into society. It's summer 1974 and the heir to the throne attends with his parents for the first time. He sits to the right of Princess Grace, a place he'll not quit for the next eight years. When his mother dies in 1982, his father takes the helm. And today, it's the prince that presides the gala soiree directing the show and the evening's events. This year, Albert has invited the rock band Scorpion to perform. The group has sold 100 million albums around the world, and some of their songs are now classics. The German band quickly rearranged its busy touring schedule to perform in front of 800 privileged guests. This is the Red Cross Gala. It's a Prince Albert's very high prestige, prestigious kind of event, you know, so I don't know about that, but I'm sure many of those guests attending tomorrow night will have a leather jacket in the closet. <laughs> Rockers on the exclusive rock, surprising, maybe. The group is extremely popular in Russia, and the new Russian jet set, rich and powerful, is ever more present in Monaco. Beyond the charity gala, the evening is a perfect opportunity for PR for the Principality. 200 people are busy at work. Everything is on a grand scale to make the right impression. The flowers, 1,000 red and white hortensias, just for the hall. And on the tables, 8,000 black roses, 1,800 white orchid branches. The preparation is meticulous and brisk, as an important visitor is expected at any moment. The prince is getting ready to leave the palace and head for the sporting. It's a short journey and he'll drive himself for once in his hybrid car. Giving his bodyguards the slip is something the prince occasionally allows himself to do, so he can drive on his own. Once he's left the palace grounds, Albert can enjoy the rare luxury of being behind the wheel, around the streets of Monaco, like any other driver. Monsieur and I have been raised with the appreciation of things simple de la vie et puis des, 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 de comportements aussi normaux et c'est ça je, je suis très reconnaissant à mes parents d'avoir euh, insisté sur, euh, bah, sur le fait qu'on ait des, des, des expériences aussi normales que possible étant enfant ou adolescent. He's driving anonymously but it won't last long. A member of his cabinet has warned security of the prince's escapade and the 550 CCTV cameras in the principality soon spot his car. The Monaco police are quickly put on attention. Oui, oui. 
les salue en retour. J'ai un, un anonymat relatif. Ça ne dure jamais très longtemps, mais... On est suivi, là Là, on est suivi, oui. Là, c'est... Les deux types louches qui sont... qui, qui, qui nous suivent. His bodyguards have caught up and tagged discreetly along. The prince arrives at the sporting to see how the preparations are coming along for the Red Cross Gala. Allez, on va écraser Monsieur Palacio. It's a low-key and friendly visit, but Jean René is anxious to hear what the prince thinks. Planning for the event began three months earlier. Jean René wants to check the timetable for the evening and whether the royal couple will dance during the meal in front of all the guests. With a simple gesture, the prince reassures the creative team. The couple will meet expectations and indeed dance. Les sommeliers, s'il vous plaît, le commis sommelier. Les gars, s'il vous plaît, allez. A few minutes before everything begins, there's a final briefing for the staff. Je vous rappelle que ce soir, les gens payent 1000 euros par personne sans les boissons. Donc je vous demande de faire un service impeccable parce que la moindre bouteille coûte minimum 350 euros et on va jusqu'à très haut, jusqu'à 10 000 euros. On fait un service soigné. Ce soir, c'est le must. Donc on a une clientèle qui est sélectionnée. Chaque client pense qu'il est très important ce soir. 8 p.m. and the soirée can begin. The royal couple leave the palace to cover the few kilometers to the edge of the sea. At the sporting, the guests have started to arrive. It's an evening that has become one of the principality's key fixtures. Aristocrats, the jet set and wealthy Russians mingle. A display of opulence that may seem out of step with the work of the charity, but the Red Cross accepts it all. It's all for a good cause. The guests have all arrived and it's time for the prince and princess to make their entry into the Hall of Stars. Then it's time for the 800 donors to settle down for dinner. On the menu is salmon, caviar, duo of sole and langoustine, accompanied by the music of a New York jazz band. Musicians are a little carried away by the ambience. In the background, Jean-René Palacio worries about the night's highlight. It's gone 10 p.m. and the group should have been playing the slow song that marks the much-anticipated opening of the ball by the royal couple. Hello, 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 hello. Lionel Richie. Oh. Hello, opening bar. And you know just the prince and princess can hit the dance floor. And I want to tell you so much. The photographs will be on all the next day's front pages. In the meanwhile, there's a tremendous buzz behind the scenes as in a few minutes, the kings of hard rock will replace the jazz men. Scorpion enters onto the stage. The prince, a rock fan, enjoys the hits from the 1980s. And when Boy George, the famous British singer, gets into DJ mode, Albert and Charlene let themselves go on the dance floor. The 
party's in full swing and the sporting's roof opens up to allow a magnificent view of the fireworks. It gives the royals an opportunity to be even more romantic. The gala has achieved what it was meant to. The Red Cross has raised 700,000 euros. Half will be used for local charity projects and the remainder for hospitals and good works around the world. That is the luxurious and prestigious image of Monaco admired and renowned the world over. But in the shadow of the prince, there's another less obvious face to the principality, one that is often forgotten. Everyday life here for the 38,000 residents, of whom only 8,000 are native Monegasques. Nationality is inherited or acquired after 10 years of marriage. It's a people with its own language and traditions and fiercely loyal to the prince's family. To reinforce these ties, the prince invites them every year to the park. Allez les gars, on monte un bloc de trois. The mayor's office makes the arrangements. On va faire la table princière de suite. It's a large picnic, but simple. Plastic chairs and large barbecues, a complete contrast to the splendor of the principality's more sophisticated evenings. Okay, c'est bon. 6 p.m. and the prince and princess are announced. Albert is wearing the traditional costume of the local fisherman. And there's no evening gown for Charlene, who sports a relaxed look. It's a chance for the couple to highlight what ties them so closely to the small-knit community. Tradition, and in particular, Monegasco. The anthem is sung in the local language. A mix of Italian and Provencal patois, the symbol of the people's identity, the princess sings along too. As the song implies, the proud Monegasques are equally united by the Catholic religion. Inscribed in the Constitution, every event here is celebrated with a Mass or a blessing. Five hundred people have showed up to meet the Prince, who is quite at ease with all of them. It's like a family family, you see. There are a lot of people that I know here since... Depuis toujours, il y a certains avec qui j'étais sur les bancs d'école, il y en a certains que j'étais dans des différents clubs de sport, il y a des anciens euh, membres du personnel du palais euh, qui m'ont vu naître pratiquement. Donc euh, c'est pour ça que c'est particulièrement émouvant et, et touchant et c'est vrai que j'ai l'impression d'être en famille. Vous sauriez nous dire en monégas que je passe une bonne soirée Passe une belle acerrate, assez rêvée. The family-like relationship enjoyed by the Grimaldi and the Monegasques is something Albert experienced at a very early age. His parents enjoyed the large popular gatherings, which allowed them to mix with the people. On the 14th of May, 1974, Prince Rainier celebrates 25 years on the throne by organizing a gigantic picnic. More than 4,000 Monegasques attend the event held inside the Principality's stadium. Princess Grace wears the traditional costume. And the prince joins in a game of petank with his subjects. Thirty-eight years later, the ambience is just as relaxed and the menu has remained virtually unchanged. Sokka, a wafer made from chickpea flour, is a staple. Ah, 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 
and the babajans, stuffed charred-leaved fritters. Secret recipe, I'm sure. <laughs> Typical and simple dishes, like the people themselves, who mingle under the olive trees. Contrary to what many might believe, the little people of Monaco, as they call themselves, is not a millionaire's club. The Monegasques are essentially shopkeepers, artisans, bureaucrats. Very middle class, in fact. A large family that will gather again soon for the biggest event of this tiny state. An autumn sunrise over the rock. Barely seven in the morning, and on the square in front of the palace, now empty of tourists, there's some serious maneuvering. Colonel Luc Frangon, the commander of the public force of Monaco, is in charge. Before him, some 100 uniformed soldiers are rehearsing Monaco's November the 19th National Day Parade. Some of the tiny principality's 130 firemen and 500 policemen will also take part. On the other hand, there is no standing army in Monaco. It's France that guarantees its defense in case of aggression. But the emblematic French carabiniers form a company of 117 soldiers, responsible for the personal security of the sovereign and his family. Oh. To give this parade a different flavor, the colonel has given free rein to the band, and he won't be disappointed. Qu'est-ce que vous jouez là pour le départ? Pirates et des Caraïbes. Pardon? Pirates et des Caraïbes. Ah oui, bien. Pirates of the Caribbean. Or Rocky. Approved by the prince himself who wants to modernize the parade. While the carabineers dust off their military marches behind the palace walls, the staff is under pressure. The throne room has been transformed into a large dining room for the occasion. This is where the prince organizes the most important lunch of the year. Is the splendidly accoutred table properly set, though? Armed with his ruler, Paul Shamana, the princess butler is checking. C'est bon. Euh, C'est pas mal. 30. There is a 30 centimeters distance everywhere, mm -hmm. apart from one setting, the worst place on the table. Et là, bon, 27, 28. Ça, c'est une des places, euh, bon, la deuxième, c'est jamais mieux. <laughs> Parce qu'elle est quand même coincée entre les plantes et tout. Et, bon, elle est assez aérée, mais... On the other hand, at the royal family's table, protocol allows for greater privilege. The painstaking work of Paul and the other staff in the palace is now ultimately in the hands of the head chef. Christian Garcia has been in charge of food at the palace for the past 26 years. It's his job to make sure today's very special lunch is a success. Momo, George, Alain, two minutes. A final check of the menu before the prince's guests arrive. Le turban de, de langoustine de Bretagne. Les truffes blanches sont arrivées. Oui, je vais te les sortir pour Après tu, regardes. après tu me les montres. Hein? White truffles, farm-bred caviar and lobster. Refined products carefully chosen with the approval of the prince for the meal. Voilà, donc le prince valide les menus par, par des croix, signe le menu. Et là, par exemple, le prince avait marqué, euh, pour, le, pour le dessert, euh, on en discutera. Et donc, ce, nous en avons discuté avec le prince Albert. Et ce sera un dessert à base de rose. Et ce dessert s'appellera le, le rose princesse grasse. 
a prestigious meal for which Christian Garcia and his brigade of 15 cooks now need to add the final touches. It's noon, and outside, the National Day is about to end. There's one last show for the people of Monaco and the royal family on the balcony. It's a motorcycle display featuring 10 of the Prince's Carabiniers and 10 gendarmes from the French presidential escort team who have come down specially from Paris. The Prince's family will soon sit down at table. In the throne room, 67 guests are getting settled in. They are ministers and councillors, all of the Principality's notables. The privileged remain silent as the royals arrive in the order they will be seated at table. Pierre Casiraghi is followed by his aunt, Princess Stephanie. The blessing is by the Archbishop of Monaco. Amen. The most important meal of the year can begin. Seated according to protocol, the prince has his sister, Princess Caroline, and his wife, Princess Charlene, at his side. And by their side, their nephews, Andrea and Charlotte Casiraghi. The lunch is in the absolute tradition of Monaco. Tradition, a key word in the policies of the 14th Sovereign Prince of Monaco. I'm tremendously proud of what my ancestors have accomplished over the centuries. It's a very daunting yet exhilarating task to uh, try to maintain that level of excellence. I have to make sure that uh, we uh, move in the right direction and uh, to support what we are today and to envisage what we can be tomorrow. Albert II's main ambition is to ensure his legendary principality continues to shine throughout the world.